Okay, we are now live. I don't know why I am particularly nervous about this live stream. Okay. I'm like a little bit sweating too. I guess it's been a little while. How is, um, how's the audio? You, you first people here, you are the true heroes of the live stream. Everything good? My microphone is here. I know it should be like here, but um, I, I feel like it gets in the way of everything. Um, good audio? Okay, cool. So I have the little chat over to the side where I can see it pretty well, but there's a lot I wanna talk about today. I took major notes. Um, I have a beverage. Um, I will fix the lighting as the sun goes down. Um, I have closed all the windows in the house, even though it smelled particularly nice outside, kind of like almost going to rain. We all love that smell. Let's be real. The windows are closed, no outside elements. The cats will probably knock something over, as they do. But I'm going to wait for everybody to get here. Ooh, thanks, Tara. You have been doing some crazy good looks on Instagram with that hair. Ooh! Um, so... I have a little bit of sunburn on this arm that stops right here. What shirt was I wearing yesterday? I'm just gonna wait for everybody to get here or enough people to get here. I'm going to be talking about a subject that, you know, some people have been talking to me about. If you have seen my like gentle decline off of social media, um, today I'm addressing everything. So periodically throughout this live stream, you might hear me catching people up almost like a podcast when people are like, if you're just joining us. Um, I've been thinking about making this a video where I sit down and film and then edit it, but I have so much to say and I just think you guys are more interested in long form videos, I guess when they are in this like live format. Um, and I just feel like you guys are more likely to click on possibly like an hour long video if it is a live stream. Plus, I would love to interact with what you guys have to say because this is a sensitive subject to me, to you guys. Um, hopefully putting the word addiction in the title of this video has not made it difficult for you guys to um, click and find this video. YouTube stuff aside. Today, I'm going to be talking about, are we all here? One drink. Ooh, we had some friends over for the weekend and someone was like, damn, is that a vintage McDonald's cup? And I was like, one of many. Um, so here we go. I wanna talk about it. I took some notes, but I, I can't really read my handwriting. Today I wanna talk about addiction to social media. And to dive right into something so brazen, I recognize is a little, a little unnerving because I don't wanna say we are addicted to social media. I don't wanna say that. I wanna talk about just maybe myself and the last couple weeks and how I have been trying to take a step back and really take an understanding and like accountability for my own actions in like my peer group in real life um and talk about like where all this is coming from so in my notes it just says how did it start i don't know if i start with myself or if i talk about algorithms in general but i think most of us who've been online for a little while remember when facebook bought instagram and it kind of changed from this like interesting indie pocket where just the things you liked and just your friends were kind of the only thing you connected with I like to think of this as like maybe a golden age because it connected me with you guys, I feel like the most. I interact with a ton of people who are like, I started following you two years ago. I started following you three years ago. I don't generally interact with a ton of people who are like, I started following you yesterday. Maybe that's a consequence of like, they don't wanna reach out yet. They don't really, they're not warm up enough up to me, but like in, my perspective of that, it's that's when a lot of the following I have now sort of 
was implemented. And I believe that's because Instagram, you had to look for what you wanted, but it was more satisfying. When they changed the algorithm out of chronological order, it was to engage us with the app. That's what it's for. People are saying it's glitching. Let me make sure I'm on the good internet. I am. Okay, people are saying if you refresh, the glitching does stop. Okay, just... So, it's clear to us now in 2018 why having the algorithm optimized has been more damaging than good. When it was in chronological order, even me, I, I didn't have a smartphone. I would check my Instagram on my iPod touch a couple times a day. I didn't feel like I was performing for it, trying to grab people's attention. I just felt like I put what I was comfortable putting out out there, and that was interesting to me. It's kind of how I met the most fundamental group of friends I had when I moved back to Philly. It's how I met John. It's like you were in a pocket that you created yourself. And you weren't overindulgent in it because you didn't miss anything. It was chronological order. It was right where you left off. You had time to go to other things. So I think when the algorithm changed, it kind of geared a lot of us up. It had all of us like speak forward and be like, hey, I'm a beauty blogger. This is why I don't like the algorithm. Hey, I'm a small shop. Hey, I make lipstick. Hey, I'm a gamer. A bunch of people in their like respective communities all came out to talk about it. And then you were like, wow, Instagram is very multifaceted. Look at all these people. Then all of a sudden, when the algorithm was optimized, you could kind of feel like trends were decided. Like, I don't remember like Instagram baddies before the algorithm. And I'm not saying those things are connected. I'm just saying that There's something out there that pushes certain things into our laps, into the direction of us. Um, You know, Instagram baddies, that's chill. That's not a stab. It's just like a, did you recognize that? Because that, remember, I remember that being like, I recognize that. So I think, you know, I was really sensitive to all of the mechanics of keeping us really engaged. It's difficult for me, obviously, because as YouTube, as my profession, you know, I have to be engaged. So that line, okay, everybody is saying it's really glitchy. I can restart my internet. Okay, we're trying to figure out the glitch, the glitch problem. Let me make sure nothing else is open on my computer. Ah! Okay, I'm restarting my router. Router, is everything cool? Love to hear from someone. Okay. Hopefully that is better. I'm sorry for like, wow, like five whole minutes of nothing. So, as I was saying, I hope I remember what I was saying. (laughs) I feel like I was somebody who was really sensitive to the Instagram change. And like I said, it's difficult for me as well because my job is so, so tied to social media. The more I engage on social media, the better chance I have to interact with somebody who might like my videos. So if you are a YouTuber who doesn't utilize social media, anyone will tell you that's what you have to do. Like I met Graveyard, Graveyard Girl, I wish. I met Mikey from Glamangor 
in like 2015 and you know, you got to ask like one question and I was like, you know, what, what's the most important thing about being a YouTuber? And she was like, Instagram. And I remember dead up, like, in, if you saw that vlog, it's probably paraphrased, but that's what she said, Instagram. You probably remember a ton of creators, like, trying to like, swim up the, for the surface for air because when the algorithm was optimized, that's when people looking for us couldn't really find us anymore and that's when people are like oh like you gotta ring the bell and that there used to be that on instagram too or like select push notifications and even some of you guys tell me like i still have push notifications for you and it's like that's when you see my content so for me this created this like false urgency all of the time and it was like people talking about not being seen on Instagram. And then people like me, a little more OG, have been on social media and stuff for a little longer. We remember the good old days. And then it's like now you have to compete and fight when social media before was like I said. You went there to enjoy the little things you liked. I felt like Instagram was a little more indie. They weren't talking about it on the news and stuff like at us at NBC6 on the Instagram. Like, it was a little more indie then. And, you know, you couldn't put money into it. You couldn't advertise on it. You just did your best. And it, like, kind of worked for all of us. Even now, I can scroll back to posts that have more engagement than currently. So what do you do? You constantly try to get to a place where you're optimized because you remember it being good. I think that's something that tied me to my phone so much more. And it was a slow thing because I was like, my friends are on Instagram and my career benefits from Instagram. And it's not just Instagram, it's, it's Twitter as well. And it's the scrolling and scrolling and scrolling. And I feel like all of these things created very negative effects on me. Because, and maybe you as well, like maybe you're relating, but I'm not trying to tell you social media is our downfall. I just want you to hear my story. And maybe you relate. Maybe you're like, hmm. So, I feel like everything I'm about to say now is after the optimization. And by optimization, I mean when Instagram and social media started to show you things out of chronological order. They started using algorithms to foresee what you wanted to see. So you lost control of the content you're exposed to. And by exposed, I mean like you don't decide to see this stuff. Your phone shows it to you. I feel like this created side effects where I was exposed to negative things, exposed to negativity through potentially comments from people coming onto my Instagram who didn't mean to, so they're leaving negative comments to me, which I was not very exposed to before the optimization. Like I said, I had a niche kind of following, so you had to find your way there. You didn't just fall from the sky onto my Instagram and you're like, this ugly bitch. That didn't happen before. So, not only Am I being exposed to negativity blatantly so? But I feel like it's a negative side effect to view things, negative things, all the time. Like, how many people can say, I went online for 10 minutes and I saw something that hurt my feelings or had a negative effect on me? Just 10 minutes. That could be waiting in line to get a cup of coffee, you check your phone. Waiting in an elevator, waiting for your bus to come. 10 minutes and you were exposed to something negative that you didn't purposely want to see. Imagine going on your phone for one hour. That's how many more opportunities to potentially see something negative. Whether it's a fight, whether it's somebody dying and they need money for their GoFundMe and you can't help them. You know, that hurts you. If it's a celebrity breakup, if it's like a a YouTuber who's in trouble, how many times do you see something that makes you go, what should I do? 
and then you tell yourself, I can't do anything. People around you will remind you, it's just the internet, so you keep scrolling, but like, if you do that six times a day, 20 times a day, how many times do you see something like, oh, donate to this crisis, and you just, you can't, you can't afford it, you don't have time to because you're just checking your phone in an elevator. You feel, you feel guilt. You feel heavy. You know, how many controversies, how many outrages, you know. That aside, there's also the best of the best. How many times have you seen someone have a fairy tale wedding? Someone have an amazing vacation? I know something that has hurt my feelings for, like, no reason. There's this one, like, viral tweet from, like, maybe the last year where it's a girl and she's like, I had a bad weekend and my boyfriend, sorry, it's fireworks, my boyfriend surprised me and took me to Disney World. How many of you woke up the next day to your boyfriend like, you're not shit? When, in reality, maybe you're in the best relationship of your life. You just put this weird expectation on your partner because you're not even, you're not even in the physical world anymore. A lot of this, this entire realization started on my birthday. And I'm going to be completely honest with you guys. And it, I'm going to sound like a huge bitch for the next 20 minutes. But I hope what I just said kind of sheds some light on the realization. So, it was my birthday. I did my hair. I did my makeup. You know, I was probably on Instagram story all day. I celebrated my birthday for a couple days. So, you guys were wishing me happy birthday. I felt good. I was like, yeah, it's my fucking birthday. Like, I never thought I'd be 28. Like, look at my life. Look how good it is. Look at all these cats I have. Like, I'm in the best apprenticeship of my life. Like, I, I did my hair and makeup. I had a nice outfit on that was a little weird, so I was feeling kind of confident. Like, yeah, wear that weird-ass outfit. John calls me because I expect him to give me the best birthday of my life. That's how high the bar was. The best birthday of my life. I wasn't turning 21. I didn't fucking win the Nobel Peace Prize. And, you know, our relationship starting over is kind of new. The best birthday of my life was my expectation. And it's because I would saw, seen the best, best weekend. That girl just had a bad day and her boyfriend took her to Disney World. I was sitting at home like, when is John coming home to throw me the best birthday of my life? John calls me and he's like, hey, parking authority put a boot on my truck by accident. I'm waiting for like the captain to come and take it off. I'm going to be late. And I remember telling John that he fucked up my birthday. It wasn't his fault. It was completely out of his hands. And a couple weeks later, that's pretty funny. It's pretty fucking funny that the Philadelphia Parking Authority is so classically out of their mind that they accidentally miss, like, put in John's license plate number wrong and put a boot on his truck. But my expectations were so crazy, surging, sky high, when I've been a modest person my whole life. If John just came home and was like, I love you. You know, 10 years ago, that's all I ever would have wanted. Being in love is the best thing you can be. And I just thought that my love wasn't comparable to all the girls who were getting, like, the Morphe highlight palette for fucking Easter and shit like that. And my birthday wasn't even good. I was like, I'm this YouTuber and my birthday's not even good? That's when I started to really understand how fucked up my mind had become and my perception of reality was so skewed that a couple years ago I shared a bedroom with a girl 
and I had no money and I could only use my iPod touch at the coffee shop because we had no internet and that was the best life I ever had. Now I'm spoiled rotten by perceptions and images of people on vacation and with their cars and their nails and their phones and they present themselves as people just like you. So you're like, well, why am I not just like you? What the fuck? And I took a good fucking look at myself and I was like, this is where I want to be. Why am I completely fucking it up? Because I'm not in Disney World where I've never been and I don't like particularly even want to go to. Like, what's going on? Why am I like this? And it's just like, I'm just a physical walking, oh, Instagram, double tap, retweet. Like, this isn't me. It's not me. And it was very, very scary. My cats are really scared of the fireworks right now. I don't know if you hear them. So I had to think critically, like, I'm addicted to social media. It's having crazy effects on me every morning. And I'm going to be completely honest with you. Every morning I would wake up and sit on my phone until 10 o'clock. And I would be late for work, even though I woke up at 7. So I was on... Instagram, email, Twitter, like a little bit of this might seem crazy, but since YouTube is my job, answering emails and like shit like that kind of sprinkled in. So if you're like, damn, that's a lot of hours, like a little bit of forgiveness, but not really. That's how long I was online. I would get to work and then check my phone when I got to work. And then periodically throughout the day, I would go downstairs and just look at my phone. Not, I wasn't waiting for a call. Nothing. Just look at it. And in that time, like I said before, 10 minutes, you might see something negative. You might see something that makes you jealous. You might see your friends all hanging out and you feel left out. You know, you might see an old friend that you don't connect with anymore and you ask yourself why. Or you remember something reminds me you of some shit you were supposed to do like two weeks ago and you're like, what? What's wrong with me? Every night before I would fall asleep, I would be on my phone until I fell asleep. Every night, I would wait for John to roll over, and then I would roll over on my phone. No cuddling, no arms around him, no kiss goodnight, because I wanted to be on my phone to see stuff I don't know. Instagrammers, I don't know. Shit in other countries that makes me sad. Shit I can't control on YouTube, you know? I was like, why do I do this to myself? And another big thing is my YouTube comments. Sometimes they're really fucking mean. Sometimes they have no respect for my boundaries. People ask me really personal questions and people know exactly what to say to hurt my feelings because all of us are on the internet so well that we're all private investigators and stuff like that, and everybody, like, there's just no, everybody will ask you really invasive questions, kind of, like, all the time. Even, like, I posted this picture, this beautiful picture of my grandma, like, so, just, like, I can't believe it. I just loved it so much, and some of the shit I had to delete off of this, like, comment thread was so weird to me, but that was after, Another thing about social media is my approval seeking behavior was out of control. I've never been like an ass kisser, like that term. I've never been like out of my way people pleaser. I just think that like, you know, the golden rule. Do unto others what you would want done to you. You know, I'm a nice person, I think like classically nice, I'll hold the door open for somebody, I'll chit chat with somebody while we're waiting for the bus, you know, but with social media, my approval seeking behavior went out of fucking control, like, I needed, 
I needed to, like, if I straightened up and John came home, I would be like, did you see I straightened up? Did you like it? If I made dinner, I'd be like, did you like it? If I was at work and, like, I missed out on something, I'd be like, what happened? What did you guys talk about? Then what happened? Oh, were you mad at me? Were you mad at me? Are you mad at me? She was short with me. Is she mad at me? All the time. And so much of it is conditioned from social media because we post a photo and we're like, does everyone like it? Did it offend everybody? I didn't want it to offend anybody. Oh, I did want it to offend somebody. Did it offend them? Did they like my video? Did they like the editing? People didn't like the audio. They said the audio wasn't very good. I'm going to have to improve it. Okay, what can I do better next time? Every day, every day I had these crazy thoughts. So... It's like, after all of this, my normal life did not stimulate me at all. You have your phone, which is access to everything wonderful in the world. Jokes, pictures that are pleasing to you, information, stories, feminism. And that's one thing too. Am I feminist enough? I hope so, because everyone's watching. My normal life didn't mean shit to me because I, because I was online. So it's like, because of that, all of the negative negativity was very exaggerated in my head. If someone left a mean comment or if I saw like a Twitter thread that was a fight if there would like whatever out whatever we were all outraged about for the day i would hear that in my head as the little devil on your shoulder as the negative voice inside of my head if somebody messaged me and they were like what's her problem she's like she's so fucking dumb like anything like that i would be like I can't believe this guy said it was dumb. I can't believe that fucking, okay, like, that's fucking dumb because I looked at your username and you're fucking dumb, like, all day, 10 times a day, 20 times a day. Like, when my freckle videos came out, I was so defensive that you couldn't even talk to me in real life because I would be like, well, I can get fucking freckle tattoos if I want to. Well, I already had tattoos. I mean, I already had freckles. So, like, that's okay if I already had freckles. Like, I just got them enhanced. Oh, you can't get enhancements? Oh, well, the, Kardar- the Kardashians get enhancements. What the fuck? Why can't I just be me? You don't, you don't want me to express myself? To anyone who talked to me. To anyone. Because I was so defensive online and in my head, that shit carries over. And that shit sticks on your clothes and you take it to work and you shampoo people and you're like, well, I had a fucked up morning because someone I've never met and whose opinions literally shouldn't matter to me, are it's all over me. Like, if you are in your head for six hours, like, you ever go to work in a bad mood or you ever fight with your partner before work, or they text, if anyone texts you, I need to talk, and you spend the rest of the day at work, like, if someone fucking talks to me, I'm gonna pop off. Like, when I worked at McDonald's, the guy I was seeing at the time, like, we used to get in arguments, like, it was my first, like, trial, like, heavy-duty relationship, and we would fight via text message it was it was before smartphones we would fight via text message while i was at work and it was like being in a cage now i'm fighting with people i don't know and it's like oh i gotta get that clap back i have to say the last word i have to defend myself and then people are like oh you only respond to the negative and then you're like well yeah the negative is what sticks to you and it hurts And it fucks you up. And it's psychological. It gets in your head. Because you're like, hey, I thought I had a pretty good haircut until I posted a picture of myself on the internet. Now I wish I never got that haircut. And now I wish this. And now I wish I was prettier. And maybe I should get lip injections. And maybe I don't look like what that girl thinks is beautiful. 
Well, what is beautiful? Not me. So, then what? All of this, this negativity, you feel like shit. So you do your makeup, you look good, you post a picture of yourself, and the cycle continues. The approval-seeking behavior. I'm on my phone the rest of the day. And then I'll say shit like, I'm too busy. Like, I have probably only gone home to see my grandma like three times this year because I'm too busy. But if I wake up in the morning and check my phone for three hours, that's three hours I could have did my hair, my makeup, and went to the train station. My house was a mess. And I kept saying shit like, well, I just moved in. When I would be up here watching H3 podcast on my phone the whole time because I can't even watch anything because I'm not stimulated enough. If I'm watching a TV show, I'm not stimulated enough. So I have to be on Instagram too. Like, my, it, it was just endless. So I made so many excuses. John would be like, is there any clean laundry? And I'd be like, no, I was busy. And I would take it really personally when it's like, that's your best friend. Do his laundry. Like, do it. Do your laundry. But I would say shit like, well, I was busy. But you could trace my day and see that I was on my phone for seven hours. But I was so engaged that, like, I didn't know. I think something that has really hooked all of us to our phones, and I hate to say it because when it came out, I loved it, and it's stories. Stories are on Instagram, it's kind of like, or Snapchat, you take pictures or videos of your day, and they only last for 24 hours. So it's kind of like, if you put sus substance in the photos you take, they disappear unless you save them. So, stories. I used to do stories all the time. I would have stories every day. And when I was hanging out with Ryan, I would do stories the whole time. Because I was like, this is the most fun I have. I'm going to share it with everybody. But when you are worried about what to put on your stories or what presentation of yourself you are giving out to people, like how you're presenting your life, you're not engaged. I feel like I may have lost a ton of time with someone who was so important to me because I was watching my life through my phone and then out the lens. For something that lasts for 24 hours, like you can save your stories to your phone and keep them for substance, but quitting stories has been something that has really grounded me and keeps me alive in whatever moment I'm living. And like I said, my expectations are a lot more level-headed, are a lot more grounded. You know, my approval-seeking behavior has really chilled out. You ever post a story and someone replies to it, like, on some shit, and you're like, oh, now I'm gonna fucking tell you. When that person has no access to your life. Sometimes, you know, I thought, oh, I'm going to show somebody, like, honest perspective of my life. I, like, thought I was a hero. I was like, I'm going to show, I'm going to shed some light on what my life is like. Because I'm such an individual, I'm going to show people what it's like to be me. So they can be okay with being themselves. But the problem with this is, you know, some people have a hard time understanding what it's like to live in a city. To live, like an urban kind of lifestyle. And that can cause confusion if you live in a rural place. If your only understanding of the culture I live in is from my story or from the internet. You know, there's confusion there. And instead of people just witnessing it, sometimes people would message me and be like, what the fuck? Or, you know, you just never understand exactly what's going on in somebody's life. So if all these people are constantly trying to interpret it. Obviously, people are going to get it wrong. And then that's where, like, people asking questions that are too invasive comes from. And you're like, well, that's 
maybe just a little natural because I can't over explain everything. But we're naturally curious. And when I'm putting out like performances on my story to show like, look how crazy it is that I'm at the grocery store. You know, in my mind, I was like, this is fun. This is engaging me with like the mission at hand. You know, I would feel like, oh, am I at like this cool haircutting show? I'm going to take videos of it for the, the people who follow me who might be in beauty school to show them what like, what it's like to be a hairstylist and stuff like that. When really, I'm not fucking paying attention to the show I just paid $25 to go to. So I stopped doing stories. I posted a few stories today to promote this live stream, but that's because people are more likely to see my story than my Instagram because of the algorithm. But I really do feel like stories, stories I feel like potentially, like not everybody, but stories can potentially rob you of an authentic experience. And your authentic experience has to be the one you enjoy. The one you create in order to embellish your life via Instagram isn't real. It's shallow. It's, it's just not there. And flexing for my story and trying to fabricate and bump up what I was doing every day to make it a little more special just like didn't have the effects I thought it would. I thought present, presenting an average life would glamorize my own life and make me love it more. But then at the end of the day, I just didn't have anything. I would spend five hours with my friends trying to create a movie about how cool it was and we were all hanging out. Instead of hanging out, that might not be the case for you. You might be able to snap that photo, get back in, show everybody you're having a good time. This is my perspective. This is me trying to cope with my addiction to social media and how devastating, how devastating it has been to take a step back and look and look at how much I've fucked up everything. Just by being completely, a thousand percent engaged in social media and stories and making social media content for basically an invisible audience, you know, before the algorithm, before Instagram was optimized, I truly felt more connected with the people. And now I'm so worried about the people who are going to say something mean to me that like I only produce the best of the best. And imagine that. Imagine only seeing the best of the best of the best every day. The best outfit, the best makeup, the best hair. You go out the door and see the regular people in your neighborhood and you're like, they're butt fucking ugly. You don't have the latest tart palette, you're butt fucking ugly. When if you spend five days off social media, ten days off social media, it changes. So after my birthday, I said, get off your phone. I had put my Instagram app to the last page of my phone and John deleted his Instagram. So the first couple days, it was easy. As easy as talking yourself up to jump in a freezing cold pool. Everyone's watching you. Someone already did it in front of you. And you're like, I know once I jump in, I'll get used to the water. But I know it's going to be fucking cold when I jump. I jumped in. And I didn't take any pictures during the day. Which is something I do constantly. I take a picture of my cat my food, my house, my trip, my commute, when I get there, all day, I take a thousand pictures. I have whatever iCloud package is $10 a month is the one I have. Why? I didn't take any pictures. One thing I had, like I said earlier in the stream, if you just got here, one thing I had a really hard time with was 
hearing negative negative thoughts like hearing my own negative voice over and over very loud in my head and i remember i saw this tweet recently that was like anxiety conspiracy theories you have all day about yourself and i was like yeah that's perfect because that's what i have all day i just remind myself about how imperfect i am in the eyes of the world and how I'm worthless, and how I can't fix it without plastic surgery, without going back to school, without, I don't know, being with somebody else, having a car, moving to New York, all day in my voice, all day, like, oh, no one fucking subscribes to me, all day. So I started reading, and... I had picked up a few books because I like to pretend that I read because that's popular to say that you read. Um, And I decided all of the books that have been sent to my P.O. box by you guys, I'm going to fucking read because it's really nice of you guys. It's very intimate that you liked a book and you sent it to me. So I did that and I got through my first book pretty quickly. And I would take the bus. I wouldn't ride my bike. I used to be like, oh, my bike is the only time I'm truly unplugged. But there's no test because both of my hands are obviously on handlebars. The true test was to take the bus and not check my phone. So I started reading. A a girl from Australia sent me a book of poetry and a manga about a cat who loves his owner. Um, And I also got a book from Korea about, I think it's called A Hundred Shadows, but I've been calling it Shadow Rising. I read these books. And to be engaged with literature that wasn't dialogue, because whatever you read on Twitter, whatever you read on Instagram, it's dialogue. So I was like, okay, this was to reset, reset everything in my mind. Like, hear someone else's voice. Because if you read something online, it's still interpreted the way you understand and comprehend language because it's all dialogue. So I was reading. And I didn't take a picture of the fucking book. Read it because you want to. That's what I told myself. Um, and to spend time... Like, obviously trick myself. But to spend time without that negative dialogue was really helpful to me and it really helped me just create some sort of structure in a place where no structure has been. Then I looked at everything else in my life that I have put aside or done half-assed because I was online. I moved in to this house, I would say in February, and I was still not unpacked with no excuse. So I cleaned. I cleaned the house. And a little bit approval seeking behavior, I wanted to impress John, but I wanted John to know that, you know, he didn't have to pose with me on my Instagram to really love with love me and give me the best birthday ever so I could take a picture of it. To know that he loved me. And like I said earlier in the stream, To be in love, isn't that some of our favorite things? And again, I was sleeping next to him at night without my arms around him because I wanted my hands on my phone because I thought I was going to see something better than love. I lived in a house that was trashed with my own shit and my clothes thrown everywhere because I have to have the best outfits for Instagram. Because this was all you saw, just this. You didn't know that my room was a mess and that my living room was full of boxes and that the cats were tearing up the boxes. You know? It's just... I just was like, so... I didn't know, so I started cleaning. And it's, it's hard to clean... And it's not a performance for Instagram. 
You know what I mean? It's hard to hang a photo on the wall and it's not a performance for Instagram. Those used to be my motivators. It used to be clean your room so you can make a video about it, not just clean your room so you can be a normal fucking person who's proud of something or who isn't a slob so people can come over. So I cleaned and I didn't take any pictures. And then I would go to work and I just left my phone in my purse and I didn't go and check it. Just these were little things. And I'm not saying that I figured something out. These were, these were milestones in my attempt to unfuse myself from how dependent I was on the internet. So, sorry, I haven't looked at the, the chat for a minute. <clears throat> so, these were just like little things. Now, the thing about my situation potentially being unique or parallel to yours is that my career really holds weight on me being on Instagram. And it's either because I'm a YouTuber or because one day I want to be a successful hairstylist. So I told Josie, Josie's my mentor. I said, Josie, I only want to make one video a week on YouTube. I'm taking a big step off social media. And Josie said, I really recommend that you find a balance. And that's because if you want to be a hairstylist, if you want to be a tattoo artist, if you want to be a pin maker, if you want to matter, you have to be online. Now, Kaylin, she is the master colorist at my salon and the educator. Her online presence isn't very strong. But just this year, Allure Magazine, it's the magazine that's out right now on stands, found Kay's Instagram and featured her for Philadelphia Best Hair Color. Allure Magazine, you know? And I would have made a big old fucking video on my Instagram, but it happened a few days ago, and I was like, just enjoy Kaylin, fuck. But that's how important it is to be online and be a hairstylist. So I told myself, if you're going to delete your Instagram, you might as well just fuck right off and quit your job. So I told myself, boundaries online. Stop reading the comments on your YouTube channel because they're fucking with your head. They're always going to be disapproving comments on whatever video you post. People, however they're brought to your channel through algorithms you can't control or whatever. People are always going to be upset that they watched your video if they didn't like it. And we're all individuals. And all of us have complete access to content we love. So when we're exposed to content we don't love, usually we take it out on the content creator who shoved it in our face. Even though on my end, I have no no control on what you guys see other than if I make a video and put it out there. That's my control. So I'll get comments that are like, you know, I only like your tattoo content but it'll be on one of my vlogs. Or I'll make a video and someone's like, you didn't try that hard. And I'm like, yeah, I did. Took all day. I made a video about um, celebrities that had surprisingly good tattoos. And I remember I loved making that video because it was right at the beginning of like my social media diet. And... I had plenty of time to create that video, to work on it, and then take a step back because I was like, all right, don't burn yourself out. Take a step back. Do some laundry. Walk to the store. Like, don't burn yourself out on this video. And then one of the first comments is like, you didn't try that hard on this video. And I remember reading it and being like, what the fuck? What's all this been for? What has this all been for? I was exposed to something negative for the one hour window I was on the internet. You can't change it. But 
I knew that I had to change myself and I was trying. So, just making boundaries for myself and understanding how much time I was going to allot myself to being online and obviously not exposing myself to negative things. Twitter is a place where I am exposed to a lot of negativity because it's kind of where I get all my news that might be an unpopular um, phrase or like a millennial phrase like, oh, you get your news from social media? (laughs) But I do because I think that whatever is trending on Twitter is what we're all talking about. So I feel like it's pretty authentic. What we're saying is like usually opinion based and opinions aren't facts, but they lead you to what is happening and then you can decide to do research. It's just that decide to do research where a lot of people fall flat or they stay with their opinion and their opinion becomes fact because they believe in it. I do get a lot of my news from Twitter and it's also where I get a lot of topics from that I talk to clients about later in the day. Um, It's like a little trick I have because if you engage with somebody at the shampoo bowl and tell them something and they learn something, they're more likely to remember who you are. So, I check Twitter every day, and it's often where I'm exposed to something negative. If it's a fucking school shooting, if it's a a crisis in another country, or if it's just, like, a fucking rap battle. If it's negative, and you read the comments, and the comments just get worse and worse, you lose faith. You lose faith for humanity and the people around you. So... And this might just be my personal experience. When you get off of your phone, you're going to notice how many people are on their phone. So I took Olive, my smallest cat, to be neutered the other day. And it was a whole fucking adventure. He shit in the Uber. I got kicked out. It was a Tana Mojo story for the, the, the masses. But... I'm off my phone. So I'm like, this is fucking weird. I'll call my grandma, I guess, and tell her what happened. We have a good laugh. I'm all the way in, like, the middle of North Philly, a little out of my element, you know, not too far from my childhood home, but still out of my element. And it's, like, 8 a.m. And I turn it into an adventure. You know, I don't check my phone. I have my book in my bag that I'm reading because now I read on my commute. I don't check my phone. And I'm walking around and I'm like seeing the ground and seeing people and seeing neighborhoods and street art and graffiti and new construction homes, old construction homes, just like things I'm interested in. And like I said, only a couple of blocks from my childhood home, my imagination is wandering. I'm like, what if I would have, what if I would have grew up here? What would it have been like? You know, where did my mom play? Where did my grandmom go to school? Instead of like this negative voice I would have had in my head, like just pounding on me. Like, oh, you waited this long to get your cat neutered. Nothing. Because no one knew, right? Privacy. Imagine it. It's so safe. No one knew. So, I take a subway. I'm sorry, I take the elevated train line. It goes above the city. And I'm waiting on the platform, and everyone's on their phone. Now that I'm not on my phone, now that you might not be on your phone, at least all the time, moderation is what I didn't have. Everyone on the platform's on their phone. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Across the platform. 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. Everyone's on their phone. Young, old, you know, well-dressed, poorly dressed, just like business casual, mom, you know, you kind of can read people by what they wear and look like. Not, I'm not on my phone. And it's a little surreal. It's a little out of this world. It's a little twilight zone. No one's looking. No one's looking at me. No one's looking up. You're just on your phone. And if you drive, you might relate to this. 
When we're driving, if we stop at a stop sign, if it's a red light that turns green, John will have to beep beep to like tell the person like, hey, look up, it's green. This, if, if there was a way for me to calculate this data and be like, this is more common than four years ago, I feel like those numbers would represent people on their phones distracted driving. In the last week, three that I know of, three pedestrians in a hit and run in Philadelphia, separate occasions. One woman killed a kid in South Philly on a side street, which means she wasn't going fast, she just wasn't looking. A kid in the crosswalk killed him. And I don't want to say it's because you're on that phone killing kids because you're on that phone. But standing on the subway platform, the elevated train line platform, seeing everybody on their phone was very surreal because it was me. Every time I would take the train, I would take a picture of the train, take a picture of my shoes, take a picture of the skyline. Oh my god, it's so fun. I take the train four times a fucking day since I was born, but woo! Look how cool I am. So from the train, I transferred to the trolley because I don't want to take Lyft or Uber because I used to be like this. I used to only have access to the train, the bus, my bike. I'm like, remember that? It was cheap. You had no other option. Do it. I'm on the trolley and these two kids um, see the book I'm reading. And it's like a boyfriend and a girlfriend and they're younger, like school, maybe on their way to school. And I'm listening to their conversation, kind of like, obviously I'm reading a book, but I hear them. And they're just like a new relationship, like a high school little thing where they probably only see each other like on their commute and at lunch. And it's the best part of their day. Like I could relate. Love is the best thing. And I just felt so captivated by them and happy to the point where I was (laughs) smiling in real life, unprompted by like a meme or like dialogue, literally just saw something I enjoyed and it made me happy. I don't know what kind of person I am that that is not a normal occurrence, but I'm very pessimistic and usually in a bad mood because I saw something on my phone that made me angry that I can't control. So, I like took that experience with me and was happy that I was able to capture it. They were talking about the book I was reading and they were like, oh, I read that. And instead of being like, these people on the bus wouldn't mind their own business looking at my book. I was like, I am so captivated by these kids. I love love. I love two kids who have both read the book I'm reading, which was interesting to me. And just like, here I am on this trolley and it's the only place on earth I want to be because there's no urgency. Social media makes you want to be doing something all the time and it's not the best thing ever, then you're wasting all your fucking time. Are you waiting in line, loser? Because I'm fucking surfing in California. Fuck you. When there's no urgency, all of a sudden I can enjoy what is so simple. Around this time, John invited me to help do the interior of the Bronco. And this is what I would have said before. No, I have to film. And I have said on this channel, if you want to be a YouTuber, you need to be comfortable with saying that. And your friends have to get used to it or they're not your friends. I've said that. But filming all the time and constantly creating YouTube videos because other YouTubers I watch are on a crazy fucking schedule makes no sense to me because I'm a small YouTuber. Making as many videos as Graveyard Girl, one, doesn't fucking matter because my numbers don't change, and two, obviously it has done a lot of damage to her. So at least I caught that shit early. And was like, just make one video a week. Just make one good video once a week. And if it's not that good, it'll at least be like the five videos you used to make a week when you thought you had to make that many videos a week. 
So I had time to work on the Bronco with John. And I had time to learn how to install a clutch. And I think it's so amazing that John is somebody who can work with his hands to create something. And I used to think I can create things, things I'm proud of, but they're not tangible things. And I don't want to discredit fucking actors and movie directors and editors and other YouTubers and things like that, but when I spend a whole month working on 10 videos and then the next month I just have to make 10 more and then the next month 10 more, it's like, do these even fucking matter? Because people won't even watch the videos from before because they're from January. When John put a new clutch on a car that we drive every day and we went to a junkyard and he taught me how to like go to a junkyard and we ripped everything out of the interior of the car and now I feel so much more comfortable with some power tools. And we talked to people in the junkyard and I didn't take a thousand pictures to like commodify what I was doing because when you novelize something that the 10 other gentlemen in the fucking junkyard have to do every day for their job or their beat up cars or like they can't afford to take it to a mechanic so they do it themselves when you novelize it and you're like look at me at the fucking junkyard isn't this crazy that people do this yeah some someone might see that and be like cool i'm inspired to go to a junkyard and other people might be like yeah that's fucking crazy that people do that so i was like no phones I just want to do this with John, because John's not on his phone. Like I said, John deleted his Instagram when him and I were both like, what the fuck is going on with our heads? So, I feel like the thing about this and a thing about, like, how connected it is in my YouTube and only making one video a week, you, like, you ask yourself, like, I don't know, you ask yourself, what about my career? What about being a YouTuber? What about the opportunity that you were given? What about the lottery that you won to have your videos noticed above other people? And my, obviously my channel has been affected by things on YouTube. A year, two years ago, my videos got the same amount of views that they get now. And my subscriber growth is not very strong. I never signed to a management agency, which is something I think about lately and think I regret. I never signed to a network, but when YouTube was a huge part of my income, I couldn't have afforded it when I lived in my apartment. If I would have made even a hundred dollars less, I wouldn't have stayed afloat. So when I think about it like that, you know, it is challenging. I try not to beat myself up about it, but my channel has not seen growth. When I had to decide, you know, I was like, if I don't make three videos a week, I will lose subscribers. And everyone will tell you that the algorithm favors daily content. Everyone will tell you that. I don't know if it's true because none of us understand the YouTube algorithm, but people will say daily content is favored. And if your bottom line is, I have to make 10 videos a month, that's what it is. You have to do it. If you put out content, at least someone will view it, you know? So obviously I expressed that to John. I was like, it's my job. It's my job to be online and now I don't know what to do. So John told me, he said, the more famous you get, the harder this will be. And John's been here through a lot. Like two months ago, we had like a pretty big security scare that I never made public. And uh, it's just from someone online who wants to be hurtful and somebody who decided to take time out of their day to research my legal name, which is not a part of my identity, find out my legal name, and then use it to harm me. And John was there to hold me while I cried all night to think that someone on earth would hurt me 
when my channel is not very politically driven. So what did I do to hurt this person? I don't know. But John was there through that. And obviously, security became a huge factor. And I made a joke. I think, like, Rachel texted me and asked me if I was okay. And I was like, I feel like I should at least be at 200K to be at a, have a fucking security threat. You know? That's dark humor, but it's scary shit. And if I was like a politically driven channel, maybe something I'd anticipate, but I just make tattoo videos and talk about stuff I like. Imagine that. So fast forward till now, John was like, if you make all these videos and you push yourself to the edge every single week and you spend no time with me and no time with your cats and no time at your salon and you just make YouTube videos in order to be more famous, this is what happens and it's true the bigger i get the more i am exposed to negativity the more i am exposed to a potential threat and everyone is always so obsessed with where they all started if you saw my inked magazine interview i think the title's like her unexpected or unconventional rise to fame. And it's like, it's true. And then I started to love making YouTube videos. And I made videos for three years before I ever became a partner and got an AdSense check. <laughs> and it'll drive you crazy when people who are like, I'm a smaller channel and YouTube is suppressing me. And they've only been a YouTuber for like three months. And you're like, well, maybe. But why were, why was I making videos for so long without a paycheck? You ask yourself. And why was I working so hard for nothing before? It's because I liked doing it. Not because I thought I had to beat the algorithm or shit like that. I just liked doing it. If you asked me to make an, another episode of X-Files tomorrow, I would be terrified. Because I'd be like, that boy is going to find me and he's going to figure out my salon and someone's going to be pissed and someone's going to expose me to as revenge or something like that. When before it was just me and a couple girls talking about <laughs> fucking dating fails. And one of my models I did for one of my hair color classes met me through one of those videos. She's like, yeah, I noticed you make tattoo videos, but I really like those X-Files. And I was like, oh, that was just a video I made for fun. So honestly, making one video a week, when I put it in perspective like that, sounds pretty nice. When I decided I don't want to grow anymore. You know, it used to be my dream to have 200,000 subscribers, 300,000 subscribers. It used to be my dream to like, role in the ranks of the YouTubers I admire. But I never even used to watch YouTubers when I first started. There was like two or three that I liked because I just <clears throat> needed the information that they provided. One of the first YouTubers I ever watched was Becca Rose and she's not a huge YouTuber. She just used to use elf makeup. And when I got into makeup, cruelty-free, affordable makeup was just something I liked. So it was only until like two years ago when you probably started hearing me talk about H3H3 and stuff like that, that I started to watch other YouTubers and watch Phil DeFranco and get engaged with the community. And then that's when I was like, I wanna be like them. I wanna go to VidCon and I wanna meet YouTubers because I'm a YouTuber. Um. When I had my meetup, I didn't watch any other YouTubers. I just wanted to have one. And I just wanted to have vegan donuts there. And I wanted to bring prints from a, an artist I really loved. So, so much influence kind of has shaped the way my YouTube has gone. And uh, it's interesting 
it's interesting to decide that you don't want to be famous in order to protect your soul. And I'll watch like, <clears throat> uh, one of the YouTube channels that we watch a lot is called Looper. And you get really hooked on Looper. I'm sorry, I have to clear my throat. <clears throat> and one of the loopers we watched the other day was like actors who quit, like who didn't want to act anymore. And I was like, damn, that has to be crazy. You have this great career and you just decide you don't want it. And it's like, when you're an actor, you're also a celebrity and everything you do matters. I used to think, you know, I have a video that used to be on YouTube, I took it off. But in the video, I'm like, what, what do I want to be when I grow up? You know, I, I want to be like Tina Fey. And it's like, oh, so you want to be famous. Now I'm not completely sure because fame now, every celebrity is under a microscope. Every YouTuber is under a microscope. And that's difficult, you know. I've said this before in another video. When Ryan passed away, I went and looked at his YouTube history to see what YouTubers he liked. It's intimate. I know a lot about a person by what YouTubers they like. You could probably say the same. And one of the YouTubers he was watching was iDubs. And I tweeted something about iDubs P.O. Box. And I remember I got a lot of like messages that like iDubs is really problematic, this and that. Uh, this is fucked up, Quicken. And I was like, yeah, you don't know the whole story. This is like the microscope I'm under. I wanted to send iDubs a letter. And now I have thought about it. And I was like, that would probably be too heavy if someone sent me that letter. Like, oh, my friend who's dead really liked you. Thank you for making him laugh before he died. If, if I got that letter, I might be like, um, you're welcome. Life is so fleeting. <laughs> um, so I have critically thought about that letter since then, but at the same time, that's just an example. That's just the microscope. You know, I made a joke in my vlog today, if you saw it, um, about how many people message me because my cat wears a collar. I'm like, well, I live in a city, so my experience with feral cats might be different than you. If you live in the suburbs, your cat gets out, but everyone kind of knows that that's your cat. There's like 20 houses on just my block, and then 20 more, and then 20 more. So if my cat gets out, she's fucked. But that's what I meant earlier when I was like, oh, well, my urban perspective might not coincide with a rural or a suburban or another country's perspective. But, I don't know. So, what I'm trying to say in all of this is I took a very long look at my behaviors online and although I am like, I don't have any regrets about the, the experience that I've cultivated. I don't have any regrets about the videos I've made or the posts I've made on Instagram. I think that, you know, I, I don't hate myself. I don't think really highly of myself, but I know that that's not my true feeling. I know that I just don't think I'm good enough. But... In my home, with my three cats, with John, at my salon, my grandma, I have a very amazing life. It's not, it's not like a Hollywood life. It's not a famous YouTuber's life. You know, but if, if the power went out, you know, for 10 days, Today, tonight, right now, I would know that my life is pretty good. I think some of the loneliest times I ever had were at my apartment. 
completely by myself. And I thought living alone is the best opportunity. I get to decorate and have all these videos and my subscribers are my friends, so I'm never alone. But I was on my phone from the moment I walked in my door till I fell asleep with it in my hand because I was truly alone. The people online don't substitute for human interaction, but they'll camouflage your need. You'll think, oh, I'm like talking to this John online. He's pretty cute. Like, I got it. But is it the same thing as hanging out with your friends? Is it the same thing as meeting someone in real life? Is it the same thing as like, uh, I don't know, having a crush on a barista? Is it the same thing as like meeting someone organically? I don't know. What? It's like all of that's kind of gone. Now that I'm not online, I find myself like talking to strangers and passing. And I also find myself really fulfilled with just the little things because it's not this false satiation of being online and communicating with people. There's no humanism to it. Like we can use emojis, but unless I'm talking to your face, I really don't know. I don't know what you mean and I can't see you, and then I go home and I'm a robot because I haven't talked to anybody in real life or had a normal conversation with anybody for weeks. I went home to see my grandparents, and although I did take that picture, their wedding picture, I took a picture of that because it was just the most important thing I've ever seen. Um, I went home and I didn't turn it into like some circus sideshow. Where I'm like, my grandparents are crazy. They live in the trailer park and I'm going to give my grandma a haircut and we're going to go to Acme because I can't eat anything in their fridge. When really, I'm so happy that that's my normal. That it's like a little bitter in my mouth that I would make that a commodity. You know, but... I give myself forgiveness because I do try to find the funny in everything. It's how I cope. So I don't know if that's a symptom of overexposure to social media, but maybe not. I don't know. You're, you can't ever take anything back that's online. And that's completely certain. And you never know what you posted online. You never know if it's going to go viral. You never know if something may happen and you're a witness and people find your social media to give a character understanding of you. Like, if you're a brat online, you know, and someone finds your social media, if it's for a job interview, you know, if it's for anything. Um, roommate in college, they can look you up. I'm not sure. I also think, like, earlier I said, like, am I feminist enough? In the eyes of the internet, am I a good feminist? I think some feminist dialogue I've read has been more toxic than good. And I know that's a little controversial. Please, whatever feminism is in your life that you need and use and live by and it fortifies you, that's okay. Just listen to me. There was feminist things that I read online that made me feel bad, made me feel not good enough, made me feel like I didn't measure up, made me feel defensive. And I know at the end of the day, I believe in women's rights and directly benefit from them as a biological woman. Um, but I remember all of these things I would read would make me hate John, hate men, think that, like, he was out to get me, think that I wasn't good enough, think that being, like, a white biological woman, like, made me counterproductive to the movement, and all this shit just made me feel bad and not 
proud to be a woman. And it wasn't until I talked to Josie when Josie was like, I still get to be proud to be a woman. I support everybody and I'm proud to be a woman. That I was like, no, Josie, like other people, you know, you just can't. We all went to the women's march together and there was this article that went out and it was then redacted or edited. I hate to say fake news, but it was sensationalized for clicks and then turned out to not be true that police officers were doing stop and frisk at the women's march. And then a bunch of people were boycotting the women's march because of the stop and frisk, which would put like people of color or trans people at risk of stop and frisk. So stop and frisk is illegal in Philadelphia. So that didn't happen. Then a bunch of people boycotted the march and then made the people who went to the march feel bad for going. So I brought that up to Josie. I was like, I don't think we should go to the march. And she was like, why the fuck not? Because you read something? Do you want to be at the march? Do you believe in being at the march? Do you believe in women's equality? And I was like, yes, yes, yes. And she was like, so we're going. Just because you read some shit online, what do you believe? So there's a lot of like feminist propaganda that I always fall, fall for. And I recently got an email. One of the like feminist blogs that I follow on Tumblr turned out to be like a Russian spy. Like, did you get any emails like that? I think Seth Everman did a video on it. He's amazing. We love him. But one of the like feminist blogs I followed on Tumblr turned out to be a Russian like bot who was just like putting out like insane propaganda. And the whole time I was like, yeah, that's, that is true. Uh Uh-huh. Cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. And it's really fucked up because the blog was called like brown girl city or something like that and i was watching it i was like following this blog and i was like yeah cool this girl she know she's taking the city she's a feminist she's unapologetic yeah girl and then it turned out that that was just like a russian bot like instigating propaganda to like make you feel shitty and then create some sort of divide which it did in my eyes i was just like i'm a piece of shit la di da so, I, should, I mean, shit like that really fucked me up too. So that's like that, that feminist thing where I was like, I'm not good enough when I would turn off the computer and stuff and be like, I work very closely with women. I try to uplift the people in my community. And as much time as I get to like dip my fingers in LGBTQ, like I hope, A, I hope I like am respectful and I do the right thing. And then... You log online and you're like, people like you, fuck you. And you're like, okay, oh, I'm sorry. So, um, that's something I feel. So there was something I read on Tumblr a long time ago that was like, you know, attacking the men in your household who expect you to fulfill the roles of a woman. Like these roles that you're assigned at birth, like the stereotype of cooking, cleaning, shit like that. So I remember after I read that, I was like, I'm not going to clean more than John. I'm not going to do it because then I'm not a good feminist. And this whole like brat culture was like something I really kind of ran with where I was like, fuck that. Hee <laughs> hee. And that wasn't me either. This was kind of just this idea where I thought like if I'm going to be a good feminist I need to hate men 30% and I need to do this like 10% or else I don't qualify (laughs) um where if you know I definitely was a feminist 10 years ago and shit like that too so I don't know would be nice if she read and answered some of the messages people ask or respond to comments I have not looked at the sidebar for like one hour because I wrote notes and I have a lot to say. So at the end of my rant, I would love to look over at the sidebar, but reading and talking at the same time doesn't, it gets me off track. Um, 
So what was I saying about feminism driving a huge wedge in my relationship with the people around me? When you believe you're not feminist enough, then you take a look at everyone around you and you're like, are they feminist enough? And then you realize that you were just reading some shit online that impacted you negatively and then changed who you were as a person. Um, <clears throat> so that's one of the things I feel like I've picked up on online as well. And then, you know, again, approval seeking behavior. Like I read that comment and I was like, oh no, am I not doing enough? And then it's like, why did you just create this whole video and take notes for this video if you were gonna let one person derail your whole video? Now I feel bad. So where was I? <clears throat> Another thing I feel like, you know, I've said in videos that I felt like I was getting tattooed for the sake of videos or just like trying to, I guess, fit this image that is popular online. Like I said earlier in this video, if you just tuned in, I feel like the Instagram baddie look kind of became popularized through Instagram optimization. And now I was talking to Rachel about this. Now, if you walk past H&M, the girl on the billboard or like the big promo picture outside, baby bangs, septum pierced, striped shirt, and she's like jumping, like models are always kind of like jumping. And you're like, oh, did my culture leak into the mainstream or is the mainstream like cultivating my culture as well? Not saying I own indie, but you're kind of just like, man, that used to be freaky. Now it's normal. Now everything's normal. Is that a good thing? Maybe. So, uh, I don't know. So, I feel like when all of this stuff is promoted to us, it kind of loses a little bit of soul. And that's how I feel. So, I want to hop into Inked Magazine, and I know I shouldn't because apparently I'm supposed to be in their magazine, but I'm not completely sure because they want me to promote the video I was in. So <clears throat> if you didn't know, I was in an interview with Inked Magazine for their YouTube channel. And if you didn't know, didn't know, a couple years ago, they wanted me to be a creator for their YouTube channel. But they wanted Tattoo Talk Tuesday, so I wouldn't have it for my own channel, so I said no. Which has been a, a pretty good decision I made. Good job. Um, I, you know, my goal hasn't always to be famous, so I didn't do that. So they wanted revival on their YouTube channel and had talked to me back and forth to have and come an interview on their channel. So I did the interview in November and it posted a couple weeks ago in April, I think like a week before 420. So they messaged me and they were like, we want you to promote the video before we post it. And I was like, oh, my subscribers know that I went to interview with you and a lot of them have asked me where this interview is. So they're smart. They're expecting the video. So I didn't say anything until the video was actually posted, which turned out to be like a week later than they said. And in this process, I just felt a little dehumanized as the person and not an advertiser. So me, Morgan, we don't get paid to interact with Inked Magazine. We pay. We pay money to travel there and, you know, have makeup done for Morgan and stuff. And we pay for all this stuff. It all comes from us. And lately I've just felt like I had to dance for it. And I know I shouldn't fucking say this. I know this, this, I can't take this back. But I also feel like this is a symptom of social media because 
I just feel like they don't believe that what I have to say is enough to supplement the content. So I said, I did promote the video. I promoted it in this Instagram post to bring recognition to the fact that it exists, but to promote it seems artificial. That's just not what I do. You know, I've never like done shout outs and as of lately, I've taken no sponsorships and that's just like how I roll. Not to say I don't love doing sponsorships, but I don't do whack ones. So I told them, hey, back in November, I talked about my experience going to interview with you and I said that it would be cool. And I linked them to a video where I already talked about it. And then they said, well, we want you to make a new video and talk about your experience. And I said, okay, I'll bring it up. I don't want it to be fake. So it won't be, I think I'm getting lag here. I think it's back. Is it back? Does that work? Is this a new video or is it back? Uh, okay. Everybody, I hope we didn't lose anybody. Okay, we're back. Let everyone know we're back. Um, so what was I saying? So... Sorry if I'm repeating myself, let me get back in. So, I didn't want to make like a brand new video talking about my experience because it, it just seemed a little artificial because the interview was out, you guys could watch it and I was like, there it is, cool. You guys left comments, um, the questions were easy. So, I feel like, you know, we didn't talk about tattoo culture or we didn't talk about like, what like tattoos i don't know it, it was kind of just like an introduction of me which is cool um putting myself on the chopping block for inked magazines like audience was scary to me because they let's see are we good is it lagging are we good this emoji So the interview came out and I was glad that it wasn't bad. The word bad. I was like, hey, it's not bad. Um, and it was my very first interview. So it was a milestone for me, very good. So they hit me up and they said, um, talk about the video and what's the word? and allude to uh, you in the magazine in the future. And I said, okay. Um, so my monthly favorites came out and that's what I said. I was honest. I was like, I had a good time interviewing and going to New York. Um, it was a good trip for me. Like Ryan had just passed away and it was the first time I had left Philadelphia since then, you know? and I, I wore his shirt and it was just really good. It really helped me. And I'm excited if it really does become a magazine. They said allude to it. I did, I don't know what magazine it is. They don't tell you a lot. So I did that. Inked Magazine hit me up again and they were like, we want a video just of you talking about your experience and I was like, my audience isn't stupid. They don't want to hear five videos where I talk about my experience. They can watch the video, you know? Isn't this an interview? Like, isn't, isn't it good? Like, when celebrities do interviews in magazines, like, isn't that it? So, I really just didn't understand. And the whole thing to me just felt very social media. Like, you scratch my back, I'll scratch your back. We promoted you, you promote me. And I, I really didn't like the way that felt. So like, even if this is very harmful to my career, like the looper, there's like one celebrity who uh, she was on, 
Grey's Anatomy, and she spoke out and said the writing on Grey's Anatomy wasn't that good, so they, like, wrote her out of the show. <laughs> if I'm doing that right now, fuck me. But it felt, it, it just was sad that it was fake. <laughs> it just was sad that they just push me out instead of trusting that I can make credible content. And the whole bus ride there, I thought about like questions I'd love to be asked, like what would you like to see more in Inked Magazine and stuff like that. And I was like, instead of punk rock, let's have a focus on hip hop and tattoos. Let's have a focus on, I don't know, like face tattoos and how they're huge now and like, all these things and like things I wish I could do on my channel, but it's just fucking me here. And they didn't ask me any of that stuff. And I was like, okay, but here's the thing. It's all so safe. It's all weed and boobs and weed and boobs and weed and motorcycles and Jack Daniels and boobs. Like there's no room for a quicken like to talk about what I want to talk about and when they granted me a camera in my face to show me they put me on ice for like six months they made my audience make you know everyone probably thought I was a fucking loser that inked magazine didn't want to publish my story and yeah I don't know it was just like a cold hard truth like behind the scenes just like fucked and I have a lot of faith, like, in their, um, I don't believe she's an intern anymore, the girl who interviewed me. Like, I felt pretty good about her. She has tattoos, and she's interested, and she's young in the community, in, in the office. So, when I went there, I was like, cool, yeah, you know, this is a good thing. I just felt like Inked Magazine didn't want to take a risk on me, and they didn't want to take a risk on you know, me not being, like, traditionally a tattoo model or, like, traditionally the form that they lean towards. Um, you know, I'm from Philly and this is what I rep and all I have is what I know. And I felt really confident when I got there. I was like, nothing's gonna stump me. Whatever they ask, I'll answer. Um, and the, a lot of shit got cut from the interview, but that's normal. It was a good exercise, you know, the first time I'd ever been interviewed by anybody. And I don't want to be overcritical, well, like the actress from Grey's Anatomy, but also I want to do interviews. And I want to be invited onto podcasts and I want to be invited on other people's YouTube channels and have conversations and not be this bitter bitch. But the whole promotion thing, the whole promotion thing was just, a, like, not demeaning, but just, like, disappointing. Because I thought I did good, but I thought that was good enough. To promote your own interview, like, more than five times, when, like, they never made a post about it on their Instagram, which has, like, 1.5 million uh, followers. What am I doing with 50,000 followers that is louder than you? Um... But that is just like, that's another just, it's another social media symptom. And I think some of that comes from older generation reaching out to this generation of like social media generation or social media culture where they think I know something more because of my platform, but not giving me the opportunity to speak. I don't know. In my notes, it just says promote, promote, promote. But I don't know. There was this controversy with Vice Magazine a couple years ago where they had all these unpaid interns who do all the research for them and then don't get paid. Um, and I'm not saying I deserved to be on Inc. Magazine's payroll or like anything like that. Like I gen genuinely enjoyed being interviewed. And I think I'll be very proud if I am in their magazine. I just, you know, uh, I don't know what to say. It just felt 
Mm, shallow, I guess. <clears throat> Alright, I'm looking at the sidebar now. Yeah, I don't know. I, I don't know if, like, they pay the people that they interview. I know I talked to someone who said that they were willing to pay money to interview this other person on Instagram who had initially refused, and then they put money on the table to convince them, <clears throat> which sounded poopy to me. Like, oh, I should have refused, but... I didn't want to refuse, like, I wanted to be in Ink Magazine's corner for anybody who was like me, who wanted to, you know, not see tattooing as a culture, but to see tattooing as a community, where we all come together and talk about prices and talk about experiences and talk and answer stupid questions, like, there are no stupid questions on my channel, I'll never I'll never freak out about something like that. So that's what this is like. And yeah, I wanted to plant that in Ink Magazine's corner to be like, this is cool too. Like you can be tattooed as fuck and be a celebrity and like have a whole article about bacon and shit. But also if you don't know how to email a traveling tattoo artist, you can watch one of Quicken's videos and it's painless and no one's judging you. <clears throat> Sorry. But that's just how I feel. Um <clears throat> And I I like I know how I handle criticism, so to criticize them feels unfair. But that is how I feel. And you guys, you know, you offered good insight onto their YouTube channel, which from a business is worth hundreds of dollars. <laughs> and <clears throat> like even someone's comment that was like, the audio is too loud. That is like insight that is worth things to them. And you know, if you haven't seen the interview, it is worth watching. This isn't a promotion, it's just like, that was a lot of fun. I hope I get in the magazine so I can put it on the table at Barnett Fair and feel really proud of it next to Kaylin and next to Josie. I hope that that's something that happens and I hope that they believe in me and us to enough to like roll in the ranks with them and I'm not just like social media bait. Um, <clears throat> so in conclusion to all of this, do I feel like I am ostracizing myself publicly and socially by taking a step back? I think that I do take a risk and I do miss the interactions. And I can miss, like, making stories every day. Like, for Cinco de Mayo, we all went to Kaylin's house. And everyone was popping up, taking pictures of each other, taking pictures with each other. And I felt left out because I didn't really get in anyone's pictures because I didn't take any of my own. And Kaylin had this, like, cool thing. It's almost like a wooden candle. You get them at, like, Acme. And it's just a, <laughs> like, a big block of wood you put down and it almost like has a wick and it burns like a like a campfire but it's really contained it's like a wooden candle and then it burns out I thought that was the coolest shit ever it's going to my monthly favorites and I didn't take a picture of it or anything I've been walking a lot of places and we walked to Kaylin's house and walked home there's so much things that I notice when I'm walking and like I do feel left out, um, but at the same time, when I get to work on Thursday and I haven't watched Melina's story all week, I can really ask her like, hey, what did you do this week? 
and it's not just like oh you saw I went and then you saw and did you see that girl I was with and did you like and that's how I talk too it's not her and even Josie was like did you see that haircut I posted and that way I can be like no can you show it to me and when she shows it to me it just is better there's no questions asked you know if I, if every time I posted an Instagram photo and I was like, all right, audience, this is a picture of my grandma. Yes, she is Asian. <laughs> it would cut out a lot of confusion, but I don't do that. So yeah, when Josie can show me a picture, when Melina can show me like she went to the beach over the weekend and I know when I see her, I'm going to be like, how was the beach? Because I have no pretext to how it was. So if it was terrible, sorry you have to relive that. <laughs> but I want to know. I'm a little interested in that. And I'm not trying to be that, like, that person who's like, I still believe in analog and I have all my VHS tapes. Like, even though I do. But I do believe that we are very oversaturated in social media. I believe that it has, <clears throat> I believe that it has been designed to keep us engaged longer than we ever have. And it's, you know, it's, we release so much serotonin, you know, we see likes. And I saw on H3 podcast that they, they like under calculate your likes to keep you more engaged. And all of these things to keep you engaged, like, one of the co-creators of Facebook came out and said that, like, this is such a problem, that this has been created to coincide with addiction and addictive tendencies, and that there is clearly parallels to both. But it keeps you engaged with content that keeps you on the platform. It's not content you necessarily want to see, but it's content to keep you on the platform. You ever see somebody blow up overnight? Something about them generated revenue that kept you on the platform, that kept you potentially clicking on ads. It's sad. And nothing can compete with it. That other fucking Vero, we didn't want to be on Vero. We just wanted the algorithm back. The original one, chronological order. But Instagram can't make millions of dollars off of us that way. I believe that all of us being addicted to our phones can be a social hazard. I can't tell you what to do because you might not be addicted to your phone. I never had a problem growing up. I, I never smoked cigs. Uh, you know, I drink in very light moderation. I mean, the summer's coming up, but... During the week and even during the year, <clears throat> I don't know, I'll, I'll drink at the restaurant sometimes. I never had a problem with like being addicted in that way. I've never done any hard drugs, but I don't know. You put Instagram in my face and I'm like, oh, what are we doing? Oh, I'll spend four hours on this and <clears throat> I'll watch an entire fucking movie. There's a lot of fireworks. I'll watch, like, an entire movie, but really I'm on my phone the whole time. Um, I completely stopped watching anime. And I don't want to be that person who's like, Oh, what did I used to like before my addiction? <laughs> I'll get back into it. But I completely stopped watching anime because I couldn't stay engaged with reading the subtitles because I watch TV like this. I finally finished Attack on Titan in its, <laughs> like, in both seasons, and so fucking good, so fucking good, I was so hooked on Attack on Titan, I couldn't wait to come home to watch it, it was at a point where John called me the other day, and he was like, I was like, hello, and he was like, who do you think the female Titan is, like, we, we were hooked on it. And it's so fun to just, like, get back into the things you loved. You know, <clears throat> season three for Attack on Titan is coming out in, like, three weeks. So, hurry up. 
get on it. But, um, God, it was so fucking good. And I would never have watched it if I wasn't coming out of this on my phone. And the whole Shane Dawson graveyard girl thing, I know a lot of people wanted me to talk about it. And as it happened, I was on the phone with Morgan. I was like, this is fucking crazy. This is insane. And then, like, as it kind of dwindled down, some of the other YouTubers that I like started to make commentary videos about it. Alexa Paletti was talking about it, um, which is one of John's favorite YouTubers, Trivia. And I don't know, I just felt like I hope that it's authentic. And I thought very much that Graveyard Girl was conditioned by her audience. And she was afraid of her audience. And she was afraid of the negativity from her audience. And I just saw so much of myself in what was happening to her. That video came out like two weeks ago. At that point, I was already like on my social media diet. So it was just like a reflection of what was happening to me. Um, but I don't know. Then Graveyard Girl like rebranded herself and came out with that video that's like shot in 4K. And it really just made me think like, I just have to make videos I want to make. Not what I think like the public demand is and not what I think will get views, but what I want to make. Like I said earlier in this live stream, the more famous you get, the harder it will get. And I think that's a good motto for clarity. Um, if you want to be advertiser friendly, if you want to get sponsorships and stuff. I'm also like in a place of financial privilege because I'm not somebody who wants to be rich. And it wasn't until recently that I wasn't living paycheck to paycheck. Uh, I save really well. I don't buy outside of my means. And I still spend just like I ever did when I worked at the Swan Boat Rental until now. You know, that's not a humble brag. That just is like me saying that like, I'm in a place where I don't have to make 10 videos a month. We own this home. And that's something great. So I think taking a step back and making one video a week and making video... Um, making videos that I want to make will be helpful. And getting back to like what I believe in and not letting my audience dictate how I feel and the content I create and the content I feel comfortable creating. Um, <clears throat> and like not being like, well, my audience only likes tattooed content, so that's just what I'll make. Like, no, I want to I wanna share what I know and I don't want to force anything. And sometimes I think about how there's over 100 episodes of Tattoo Talk Tuesday and I'm like, what the fuck? <laughs> You had more than a hundred things to say about tattoos. And I'm like, yeah, and I could keep going. But I don't want to force it. And yeah, I don't want to be so afraid of my audience that I don't know how to make content. And this isn't a, this isn't a stab at, at Graveyard Girl. I actually, when all this shit came out, I actually DM'd her and like, Obviously, she would never read my DM, you know? Let's see where it is. Like, I DM'd her a bunch of shit to just be like, hey, I know what you're going through. And I'm only two steps ahead of you. And actually literally can't relate because I don't know what it's like to be in your shoes. But I th I'm trying to figure things out if you ever wanna talk to somebody. Um, and you know, obviously everyone tries to reach out to her all the time. So why would I matter? 
but I just wanted, I just really related, and I'm sure a million people related to and messaged her. But I just wanted to make parallels to that. So <laughs> it is Wednesday night with the fireworks. <laughs> Um, let's see if this looks better with my light on. Yeah. Hmm. Girl. Yeah, I don't know. I've said before, like, I don't have many YouTuber friends. I hit up Morgan, like, twice a week. Because I'm like, girl, I'm having another crisis. But I just wanted to reach out to Bunny. And I just wanted to talk to you guys. And I didn't want to make a, like, reaction to Shane Dawson's video video. Because, um, I was already going through my own thing that, like, coincided with Bunny. But just, like, isn't the same. Social media is crazy. And I want to make videos that I want to make. Because I did that for the longest time. And, yes, to connect with your audience makes sense. And to make user requested videos is always really fun and cool and you guys sometimes have way better ideas than I do and it's always fun to like hear like a really good video idea and then go with it but <clears throat> yeah I don't know um and Bunny lives in Houston and I used to live in Houston and when she went to that Toys R Us I was like Oh my god! I think I went to... I think I worked at that Target. Hi! Um... <laughs> Everyone's saying your whole titty's out, bitch. <laughs> TMI, we were cleaning out Ryan's warehouse this weekend and I found the bathing suit. Because <laughs> we were like wearing it on our heads. I threw it out. It wasn't a, a precious heirloom. Um. <clears throat> so. That. Is how I feel. That's kind of everything I wanted to cover. I will be making this video. Public on my channel. So if you missed anything. You can review it. Um. I'm going to put a cushion on my seat. Because it's like hurting me. I stood on this chair, or John stood on this chair to like fix this light. And the like vinyl cracked because it's so old. So, um, I'm going to, I guess... Uh, check out the chat now if you have any questions I guess related to the social media thing I'd love to answer those maybe as a priority to keep everything on subject with the title line um, but if not I'll just answer whatever but yeah I'll hold those in like priority and if you participated in super chat let me just shout you out real quick Sorry, I have like three different windows open. Ashley Ellington, what's up, girl? I see your purple hair. Alicia, right? Hey, Quack, just wanted to let you know I love your content. Keep doing what makes you happy. Thank you. It's really nice. Osiris, what's up? Thomas McGuire, keep on keeping on. Natalie, hey, girl. Monologue on Quack. Thanks, Brittany and Chloe. We love a critical thinking and growing quick and proud of you. Thank you so much. You know, <clears throat> to think critically can be hard when you do it publicly. Um, like I said, I, I don't like I don't like being wrong or not necessarily being wrong. I don't have a problem with that. I just don't like um, like a lot of like blatant criticism that comes from a place of just disagreement. Or just like someone doesn't like something so they're critical of it like I one of the things like I posted a video about my bangs like a bangs tutorial 
and people clicked on it and didn't like it. And in my mind, I'm like, well, do you even like beauty? Are you interested in hair? Do you have bangs? Do you think I look stupid? Do you think curly bangs are stupid? Why'd you click? So it's like, um, okay, now I'm checking out the sidebar. <laughs> 